All right, hi everybody. It is time for us to take a look at the lesson 2-2 worksheet, which is basically like the lesson 2-1, but backwards. So in 2-1, we were looking at parallel lines crossed by a transversal to find the angle pairs that we know are there. And we use those angle pairs to say whether angles were congruent or supplementary. Here, we're going backwards. We're given angles which are congruent or supplementary, and we're using the converses of those theorems to say, because these are congruent or supplementary angles, I know there are some of these angle pairs, and knowing these angle pairs means now I know that there are parallel lines in this drawing. So starting with the first one, error analysis here, what is the student's error? They're making a proof. They said given that angle one is congruent to angle two, by the vertical angles theorem, angle one is congruent to angle three. So by the transitive property, also known as substitution, uh, angle two is congruent to angle three. And they said because angle two is congruent to angle three, the um, converse of the corresponding angles theorem, A, is parallel to B. But the problem is, the corresponding angles theorem requires us to have corresponding angles. And angle two and angle three are not corresponding angles because they are not on the same transversal. So here's the transversal that angle two is on. Here's the transversal that angle three is on. So they are not corresponding angles. And that's our mistake here. We can say angle two and angle three are not corresponding angles. And because of that, the rest of this doesn't, doesn't hold up. Because they're not corresponding angles, we can't say that these lines are parallel based on the corresponding angles theorem because we just can't do that without corresponding angles. Number 11. The interior angles of a regular hexagon are congruent. Why are any pair of opposite sides parallel? So in order to see why the opposite sides of a regular hexagon must be parallel, we should draw some parallel lines. Mm, can I move that? Nope, I can't move that. Let's see. There we go. Nope, that's too low. You see what I'm going for here. Good enough. So there's one line. And here's another line that we can use. And we can say, well, I'm going to draw an angle bisector between these two corners. All right, I'm going to make those angles divided right in half. And if I do that, I end up with alternate interior angles, which are parallel, right? I bisected the angles, so I know that this angle is half of this one, and this angle is half of this one, so I know they're congruent. And because I know those are congruent, I can say, since we have congruent alternate interior angles, these lines and these sides must be parallel. So we can say, if you draw an angle bisector across the shape, alternate interior angles will be congruent, alternate interior angles will be congruent, meaning the sides are parallel, meaning the sides are parallel. Down here, use the given information. Which lines in the figure can you conclude are parallel? State the theorem that justifies each answer. So if we know that angle 2 
is congruent to angle three, and we say, what's the positioning of those lines? Those lines happen to be corresponding angles of line Q and line P. So we can say, because we know this information, we can say that P is parallel to Q because of the corresponding angles theorem, or the corresponding angles converse. Corresponding angles converse. All right, what about if six is congruent to seven? So if angle six is congruent to angle seven, those happen to be alternate interior angles. And they're alternate interior angles across Q and P again. The transversal in that would be number five. So that tells us that P and Q, once again, are congruent. So this also tells us that P, or sorry, are parallel. So P is parallel to Q, but this time it's the alternate interior angles converse that told us that. All right, then we're going up to 17. Given A is parallel to C and B is parallel to C, write a flow proof of theorem 2-8. Theorem 2-8 was the one that says if two lines are parallel to the same line, then they must be parallel, right? Flow proofs are super weird. We can kind of draw them in whatever way or whatever shape or order we want to. So we'll start with our given information. A is parallel to C and B is parallel to C. And that is given. From there, we move over. And because we know A is parallel to C and B is parallel to C, we are going to use corresponding angles to help us out here. We can say, because I know A is parallel to C, I know that angle one is congruent to angle three by corresponding angles. Angle one is congruent to angle three by corresponding angles. But also, because I know that B is parallel to C, I know that angle two is parallel to angle three by corresponding angles. So I'm gonna add that into the step of the proof. You could make it a different step if you wanted to. Angle two is congruent to angle three. Those have the same reason. Those are both by corresponding angles. And your flow proof could look very different than mine. It could go up or down or around or whichever direction you wanted to. It could branch off. It's all good. So now that I know that angle one is congruent to three and angle two is congruent to three, I can say, what if, since they're both congruent to three, I put them congruent to each other by substitution, right? I'm gonna substitute this two for this three and I'm gonna state that angle one is congruent to angle two by substitution. Once I know that angle one is, ang is congruent to angle two, that tells me that these two lines, which those angles are on, must be parallel. That's what we're trying to prove. We're proving that these two lines are parallel and those two lines are parallel because their corresponding angles have been shown to be pair or to be congruent. So we can say that because angle one is congruent to angle two by substitution, we know A is parallel to B, line A is parallel to B. We used corresponding angles to tell us that. We used the converse of the corresponding angles theorem because these angles are corresponding and congruent, which means the lines they are on are parallel. So we're going to write corresponding angles converse. 
and we're done, right? Yours can go whatever way, like I said. It doesn't have to be shaped like mine, but we should be using corresponding angles because we know that these angles are all in the same position on their respective lines. So we can use them to help prove with those converse theorems. Number 19, for what value of x is f parallel to g? Which theorem justifies your answer? Well, it looks like I've got two alternate interior, or sorry, alternate exterior angles here. And I know that if alternate exterior angles are congruent, my lines are parallel. So what's going to make 10x plus 5 equal to 12x minus 9, right? So we'll solve the equation. Add 9 to both sides. Divide by 2. 7 is equal to x, right? But that's not the question. Well, it is, partly. For what value of x is f parallel to g? When x is equal to 7, f is parallel to g. But it also says, what theorem justifies your answer? We just look at the position of the angles and we said, well, it's the alternate exterior angles converse. Once we prove that those alternate exterior angles are congruent to each other, we know that the lines are parallel. So it was the alternate exterior angles converse. All right. Number 20. To make a puzzle, Denzel draws lines A and B to cut along a square piece of poster board. He wants to draw line C so that it's parallel to line B. What should the measure of angle 1B explain? This question is really as simple as it looks, right? It should be 74 because they're alternate exterior angles. If we make the alternate exterior angles congruent, the lines will be parallel. So 74 degrees by the converse. of the alternate exterior angles theorem. Number 21, again, a simple question. A downhill skier is fastest when her skis are parallel. What should angle one be in order for the skier to maximize her speed through the gate? Well, in order to make her skis parallel, our alternate exterior angles must be the same. So that would be 70 degrees. It's the same theorem, 70 degrees by the converse. Remember, converses are always when we start with the angles and we finish with parallel lines. So converse of the alternate exterior angles theorem. Let's see, the next one's on the separate page for some reason for me. In order for C to be parallel to D, Angle 2 and angle 7, which are same side exterior angles, must be supplementary. And angle 3 and angle 5, which are alternate interior angles, must be congruent. Again, some simple questions mixed in on here. Another simple one up here. Malia makes a fabric design by drawing diagonals between opposite corners. She wants to draw other lines parallel to one of the diagonal lines, as shown by the dashed lines. What should angle 1 be in order for line B to be parallel to line A? Well, if here's line A and here's line B, 125 and angle 1 are same side interior angles. So we should find what's supplementary to 125, which is a 55 degree angle. So for part A, we can say that should be 55 degrees by the converse of the alternate, nope, not alternate interior angle, I'm sorry, the same side interior angles theorem. The same side interior angles theorem. For B, here, let me write 55 here. And what should angle 2 be in order for line C to be parallel to line B? Well, if angle 1 is 55, then angles 1 and 2 are corresponding angles on B and C. So in order for B and C to be parallel, the corresponding angles need to be congruent. So angle 2 needs to also be 55. 
so 55 degrees for that one as well, but this time it's because of the converse of the corresponding angles theorem. So the converse of the corresponding angles theorem. All right, I just noticed that her tablet has a mouse on it, which is kind of funny because there's no like, there's no mouse over here. There's no keyboard and mouse. I've never seen a tablet with a mouse on it. It's on its own. Anyways, almost done. Number 24, which statement must always be true? So let's look through. If angle one is congruent to angle two, then G is parallel to H. That doesn't make sense. Angle one would need to be supplementary to angle two for that to be true. B, if angle one is congruent to angle three, then G is parallel to H. That doesn't make any sense because one and three are both on G, neither one's on H. Number, or letter C, if angle two is congruent to angle four, then J is congruent to K. Two and four are, same, or are alternate interior angles, so they should be congruent for parallel lines, and they happen to be on those parallel lines with transversal H, so C, is the correct answer. All right, and that is everything for this worksheet. Let me know if you've got any questions at all, and I will see you soon.